Thank you, Julie. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to all the visitors that have come to see those baptisms. Wasn't that great? That, that needs a response. Wasn't that great? Yes, it was good. Anytime you see uh, someone choosing to follow Jesus and particularly to stand up in baptism uh, is absolutely fantastic. I love seeing the kids declaring their faith. Um, a little while ago, uh, there was a series that came out on the tally called Band of Brothers. It was all about this military unit and about the bonds that they shared as brothers in arms as they went through the war together. And uh, uh, it's interesting as we've been looking through Genesis and we're focusing in on Joseph, that most of the story has all been about Joseph. It's been uh, Joseph getting sold and Joseph's favoritism and Joseph's character and Joseph's integrity. And today we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, so if you've got your Bibles with you, uh, have them open at Genesis chapter 42 and 43, because that's where we're going to be looking at. But today the setting does shift. And we move from focusing just on Joseph and everything going on in Egypt... And now uh, we're flicking back uh, over to Canaan. We're flicking back over to Joseph's family and what went on. Now, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall uh, to see so many things that had happened. Now, uh, where we're at in the actual story, for those that may have just joined us today, uh, Joseph, as you may recall, at age 17 was sold off by his brothers, two slave traders who took him down to Egypt through a bunch of circumstances. He went from slave to prison inmate in the dungeon and then uh, following God, standing up for God, God allowed him to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams that allowed him then to be promoted to the 2IC, the CEO or pretty much prime minister of all of Egypt. Nothing would happen in Egypt without his say-so. And all in Egypt would actually come and bow before him. Now, that was such a fulfillment of all that God had shown him as a 17-year-old. But Joseph was no longer 17. Because by this point in the story, uh, Joseph has had his happily ever after. Not only does he have his promotion, where now... All of Egypt must come and bow down to him. Now, he's also gotten married to Asenath. He's had two children, Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, both named very meaningfully, one meaning forgetting his pain and his past, and the other meaning that he is now fruitful in Egypt. But 21 years has passed since he was that 17-year-old lad. So he's... Now, approximately 38 years of age. Now, do we have any 38-year-olds in the congregation? Uh, we do. <laughs> but, of course, they only look 21 as they're... Um, so, uh, we won't embarrass anyone. I uh, had my birthday on Monday and I turned the magical 53. I don't know what, what is magical about 53. I realise the older I get, the less I want to celebrate... Uh, the less I'm looking forward and the more I'm reflecting back. Um, but Joseph was 38. He's now lived longer in Egypt than he actually lived in Canaan with his family. And we see here that God is not done with Joseph, even though he's sort of reached that crescendo, he's got his happily ever after. God is not done with him or his brothers or his family. In Genesis 41, 56, 57, uh, we read just at the end of chapter 41, so when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. So this famine wasn't just in Egypt, these seven years that they uh, had, seven years of plenty that were then going to be followed by seven years of famine and drought and all sorts of things. Now, 
we were now entering the seven years of drought. Now, you can imagine uh, how long would it take you to empty your pantry at home? Probably a lot longer than uh, if you lived back at this time because they would have kept up stores for themselves, being a, a pretty much an agrarian society. That is, they lived on the land, lived off the land. But Joseph, Jacob sorry, then sends his 10 sons to buy grain because he's heard that there is food in Egypt. But he doesn't send Benjamin. Now, this is where we come into the passage today. It is 21 years later. And I want, what, I want, what I wanted to do this morning with you is to focus not so much on Joseph now, but we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into Joseph's brothers. And first, I want to look at all of the brothers generally as to how we find them now, 21 years later, after selling their brother. And then we're going to take a bit of a closer look at two of the brothers and what was going on in their lives. Before we do that, why don't I pray for us and let's ask that God would open his word into our hearts and minds. Let's do that. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way you guide and teach us, the way that we can learn so much from the example and sometimes the faults of others. So, Father, in whatever place we find ourselves this morning, may your word come alive to us. May your Holy Spirit speak to each one. And may we grow more and more in our character to be more like Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. So, 21 years have passed into Jacob's family, a family of 12 brothers. Now, it seems as we look now at their family, as we had in that passage that was read to us, thank you, Julie, um, we can get so much out of that as to what it says about the brothers. Now, remember, Joseph was where in the family tree? He was second youngest in the 12 brothers. So the rest of the brothers were actually significantly older than him. But we see here at the very start of this passage in chapter 42 that a whole bunch of things are going on. Firstly, we see that the brothers are sitting around at home. There is a a challenge, there is a test, there is a crisis at home because famine has broken loose. But the brothers just seem to be sitting around immobilized. They seem not to know what to do. They're characterized by inaction. In fact, Jacob says to them all, why are you just sitting there? Like, get up and do something. These men were not 12-year-olds. They were not 15-year-olds. They were not even 21-year-olds. Those of you that are parents with those ages, you'll know what. Sometimes you need to motivate your children to get moving. These people now were closer to my age. They were in their 50s. They were older. And still at that age, they're not taking action. None of them wants to stand up as a leader. None of them wants to take action to resolve the crisis that is going on. They sit back and they sit dumbfounded. But not only is there a lack of leadership and inaction in them, There is also, as they now follow Jacob's command to go down to Egypt to buy food, uh, there is an integrity challenge that is there that they seem to be failing as well. Jacob doesn't send Benjamin uh, out of fear. And I find that very interesting, that after 21 years after Joseph's disappearance, now Benjamin would have been a toddler at the time, so... Benjamin is probably now in his early 20s. Jacob still won't send him. And that sin of selling Joseph into slavery doesn't seem to be known and doesn't seem to have been talked about. In fact, I wonder what it was like for the brothers for 21 years to be covering up everything that they had done. Can you imagine going to a family meal and having the empty seat? Joseph's not there. Can you imagine coming to the anniversary every year? And the father grieving 
over Joseph's death. I wonder whether their conscience ever get, got pricked, whether they ever felt guilty or had a thought. We actually, as we dig in, can see that that, that is the case. But there doesn't appear to have ever been a confession or a repentance act or anything at this point. And then they come down, and in a, something that Hollywood couldn't craft this well, the brothers are given a truthfulness test as well. They come down, travel to Egypt to buy grain for their families and for Jacob and for Benjamin and for everyone else back at home. And Joseph is there in the throne room. And you can imagine they're coming in before Joseph, probably following a big queue of people to try and buy grain. And Joseph recognises his brothers. But they, as it says here, don't recognise him. Now, Joseph, of course, has been in Egypt for 20, 21 years. Of course, he would dress like an Egyptian. He would likely have an Egyptian haircut at this point. He ate like an Egyptian, we see a little bit later. He followed Egyptian customs, we see. He also spoke like an Egyptian. We don't know if he wore bangles and walked like an Egyptian, though. <laughs> yes, I had to put it in. <laughs> but the brothers didn't recognize him. Of course, it's been 21 years. He's now 38. He's no longer 17. He no longer has those boyish charms. Maybe he's looking a little bit more chiseled. Maybe he's got a few more wrinkles on his face. Uh, but he definitely doesn't look like a Hebrew any longer as he sits up on his throne. And so as the brothers come in and they ask, can, can we buy some grain? Joseph almost has turned the tables on them. They're all bowing down already in fulfillment of what God has said. But he accuses them of being spies. He said, you've come here into the land to spy out the land so that you can plunder us and steal our grain. And the brothers claim, this is where the truthfulness test is. What do they say in verse 10? Your servants are honest men. Now, does that not grate on any of you like it grates on me? These brothers had planned their brother's murder. They had orchestrated his sale or human trafficking. And then for 21 years, they had deceived their father. And now they stand before Joseph, the one that they sold. And they said, we are honest men. You know, anyone want to believe them? Anyone want to take them at their word? And so Joseph takes them and does what any person that has been sold off by his family would do. Uh, he throws them into prison <laughs> and detains them for three days. And uh, he says one can go back. And then he realizes he actually needs to send the bulk of them because they wouldn't be able to carry the grain otherwise. And so he retains a brother and there's a whole conversation that goes on there. But it's quite interesting that he actually detains one Simeon is detained there's a conversation that goes on with Reuben and you can see at that point that the brothers are convicted by what they've done I don't know if there's anything in your life that you have done a long time ago something that you're ashamed of something that still weighs heavy on your conscience something that perhaps you still haven't put right that sense of conviction, there comes a time where sometimes you can see your conscience by no longer paying attention to that convicting voice of God that you've done the wrong thing. But that's what these brothers had done. For 21 years, they rejected God's still small voice. They rejected God's work in their hearts and lives. And they had held on to their sin and the whole deception around it. Now, as we start to take a bit of a deep dive into the couple of brothers, it's good to be reminded of who actually was in the family. Of course, we know Jacob was the father of all of them. Jacob's name gets renamed to Israel. And Jacob had, um, I hesitate to call them four wives, but he, especially since we've got kids in the house, um, but he had uh, two main wives, they had servants, 
and that was Jacob's family tree. And in this passage, we're going to deal pretty much just with Leah's children up the top as we start to have a look at what they did and uh, how they then talk about what they did. Now, the oldest, as you can see from the list there, is Reuben. Reuben was the oldest. And as today, as back then, as in Middle Eastern culture, the one who is the oldest sibling within the house often had certain privileges and often they would get the biggest blessing, they would get like a double share of the inheritance, but they also bore additional responsibilities within the family. And uh, for anyone that has multiple kids or has had multiple kids, you know often your oldest child ends up helping, running all the errands. You know, when you're changing nappies, they'll get you another nappy out, or if they need to, when they get older, maybe they have to do the babysitting. All of those sorts of things take place. Reuben is the firstborn, and he is the oldest. And as we go into the rest of chapter 42, we see this focus on Reuben and his character. So let's have a look at where he's at. Now, in verse 21, it says these words. All the brothers are talking together before Joseph. It says, they said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. But we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. And I want you to notice a couple of things as we uh, look in at Reuben. Firstly, as we look at Reuben, we can see that all of the family are recognizing, all of the kids that are, that is, are recognizing their portion in the wrongdoing. And here they say, uh, this punishment has come on us. They have an understanding of who God is in their life, and they see everything that is happening before Joseph, is now a consequence of their actions, more than they actually knew at this point. But they are being punished. But they see this punishment as coming from God. And now we see two aspects of Reuben's character where he seems to fail at being a man of character, even though he is the firstborn. In verse 22, Reuben replies to all of his brothers, he says, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. And I find this interesting at one level because here is Reuben, the firstborn, the one who has authority over his brothers, the one who has seen in Middle Eastern culture as having that control or leadership in the family, who's denying all responsibility. It's not my fault. It's like Reuben stands back and defends himself and says, I'm not responsible for what went on with Joseph. It's like my conscience is clear. He says, didn't I tell you? You wouldn't listen. And so Reuben stands back and it's like he washes his hands of responsibility and says, I I wasn't a part of it. Now, I don't know how that sounds to you, but that sounds to me like he's playing the whole political thing, which our politicians do all the time. Uh, No, it wasn't us. The, The fact that the country is a mess is because of the other party that was in before us. It's all their fault. It's all a legacy from them. Reuben could have stood up when Joseph had come to them 21 years earlier. He could have stood up to his brothers and he could have said to them, no, this is wrong, we are not going to do this. And if you do this, I'm not going to stay quiet, I'm going to tell Jacob. And then he could have gone a step further. He could have said to his brothers, if you're going to do this to Joseph, you're going to have to do it to me too. You're going to have to sell me or you're going to have to kill me too. I'm not going to stand by while this injustice plays out and while this criminal activity takes over. But I suspect that the truth of the matter was that there is far more peer pressure that went on at the time where he just played along with them. 
But where does the buck stop when it comes to sinfulness? Who's responsible? If there is sin in your workplace, for example, on your team, maybe somebody's suggesting, let's take a shortcut. Uh, If there is uh, sin in your family, at what point do you say, ah, it's all right, it won't matter? Or do you stand up for what is right and say, no, that's not right, we're not going to do that? It's a question of whether... As individuals, we are really the one that stands for truth and righteousness, whether we are the light in a dark world, whether we are salt, or whether we are just going to play along with wrongdoing and ignore it or pretend like we're not a party to it. If we look back in Genesis and you go to Genesis 3, we see the same attitude of denying responsibility in the Garden of Eden. We see Adam and Eve, of course. We know Eve took fruit, ate it, gave it to Adam. He took it, ate it. And then they get confronted by God as he comes into the garden. And what happens when they're confronted? Adam says, it was the woman. (laughs) The woman that you put here. It's not my fault. It's the woman. And what does Eve say? It was the snake. I was deceived. And the man was definitely at fault, wasn't he? (laughs) And the New Testament would agree with you. We can blame shift. We can try and deflect responsibility. Or we can own up to the mistakes that are made and say, we did wrong. Now, uh, Reuben's second fail, we see in verse 37. Because when they return, after Simeon is taken, Simeon is thrown into prison as the sacrificial lamb. Uh, I'm not sure whether Joseph had a little bit of mercy on him because he overheard Reuben defending himself and maybe he's thinking, ah, Reuben maybe wasn't that bad or wasn't so much a party to it. So he thinks, I'm going to lock up my second oldest brother um, and throw him into prison as well. Well, they end up travelling back with all of their grain. Now, they find in the top of their sacks, all of their silver. Now, remember their claim? I am honest. Do they stop and turn around? No. They keep going home. And in fact, they get home and they tell Jacob what went on. And then Reuben tries to go to his father and say, this is what happened. We said we were honest And he didn't believe us, and so he locked up Simeon. And now Jacob, not surprisingly, says, now I've lost uh, Joseph, now I've lost Simeon as well, I'm not going to give you Benjamin. And Reuben stands up, and it's like, okay, he's now trying to do the older brother thing, he's trying to do the right thing. But when Reuben comes before his father, what he says to his father, to me, sounds a little off. And you get to verse 37, and it says, Then Reuben said to his father, You may put both of my sons to death if I do not bring him, that is Benjamin, back to you. Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him back. Now, I want to highlight this particularly because it's a great contrast of what we're about to see. But when you look at that, I think, you know, Reuben, you're just a scumbag. You're going to offer up your kids if you do the wrong thing now. In your place, if something goes wrong. And it's like Reuben uh, not only denies responsibility, now he's going to evade any sort of accountability for anything else that happens. And of course, Jacob doesn't allow Benjamin to go. And so poor Simeon, Uh, maybe not as poor as Joseph, but he's left rotting in the Egyptian dungeon while they eat through all the grain that they brought back. Until, of course, the famine is continuing to go and uh, they have to actually return back to Egypt to buy more. Now, this whole idea of denying responsibility for sin 
and evading accountability into the future, um, we see it all the time, don't we? We can see it in relationships when we don't own up to what we have done that is wrong and apologize for it in relationships. It happens in our workplaces when someone stuffs up. I was talking to somebody earlier and they said they had a conversation and there were some employees at another company who had done the wrong thing and uh, I'm not sure what their managers thought of it now. Um, It happens in the church, it happens in friendships, it happens in school. Through the week, I was actually reading and watched a little video of Brian Houston. And Brian Houston had all of these things happen at his church at Hillsong. And he was claiming he was misrepresented, that he was pushed out. All of these things were happening there. Now, I'm not a part of Hillsong. I haven't seen a part of that. But again, you see two different sides coming out, one from church and one from pastors and this sort of dodging responsibility it just seems to be rife within our society today now today we might not kill our brother and sister physically but perhaps we metaphorically like to throw people under the bus um, every time something goes wrong we want to pull down others with our comments and our words rather than build them up rather than actually working through problems. And so that's why this next focus on Judah is such a contrast. Because whilst you get all the brothers failing at so many parts at the beginning and sitting doing nothing, and then we see Reuben failing in his attempt to go back to Egypt, after all the grain runs out, runs dry, Judah is the one who stands up. Because the famine is still severe. There's no Costco down the road. In Australia, if we have a drought, what do we do? We go to Costco, we buy from overseas. Um, And our poor farmers are struggling on with the drought and everything that is happening. So at this point, it's been at least six months to a year that Simeon has been left in Egypt. Now... Jacob now accepts that he needs to go back to Egypt. So he directs his sons once again to go. Now at this point, it's not Reuben that stands up in amongst his family and his brothers. But it's Judah. Judah is Leah's fourth child after Reuben and Simeon and Levi. And Reuben stands up and he is somebody who we see now has changed from that man of inaction amongst his brothers to a man of action. And Judah speaks for all of his brothers and he refuses and talks to his father and says, I will not go without Benjamin. In 43 in verse 8, this is what he says. He says, send the boy along with me and we will go at once so we, you and our children, may live and not die. Judah is not going to be backward now. He's not going to stay in the shadows, but he's going to stand up. In fact, he's going to do more than stand up. He's going to take a risk. He's going to step out in faith because he had no idea what was going to happen in Egypt. And his life was not going to be defined by his mistakes. If you think back or read back into Genesis 37 and verse 26... Who was the one that suggested they sell Joseph to the slave traders? It was Judah. Judah was the one that said, let's sell him. And now we've seen Judah change. And now instead of selling his brother, he's now going to stand as protector for his brother. It's a complete reversal, a complete contrast. And it's great hope for all of us, notwithstanding all the times that we may have failed and fallen and tripped up in our lives. But Judah is not just action-oriented. Judah also goes a step further in taking full accountability. In verse 9, what does Judah say? He says, I myself 
will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. Now, what a contrast to Reuben's uh, six month earlier or a year earlier claim of saying he'll offer up his kids. Uh, sometimes I'd like to offer up my kids. No, I didn't say that. Um, Judah comes now and he stands before Jacob as the one who previously had sold his brother off. And now he says, I will be responsible. I will take the blame. It is unqualified responsibility that Judah has. Now, Judah had children. He could have followed Reuben's lead, but he doesn't. He understands that it's up to him. And so he doesn't pledge the lives of others or some other worthless or meaningless token that he could give. He isn't going to wash his hands any longer. He isn't going to throw anyone else under the bus. But he is offering here and pledging himself to pay whatever price it comes. Whatever shortcoming, whatever faults, whatever may happen, Judah, Judah is going to own it all. And he offers to take the blame not once, but twice if he fails. And the shame of that for his entire life. Now that is a complete turnaround and a complete change. And the great thing about that is it demonstrates to all of us uh, that though we may stumble and fall, though we may make mistakes, God's grace is available to all of us. That change is possible. Even at his age, and I'm thinking he's about 53 or at least. Uh, so who's over 50 here? Come on, put up your hands. There are so many silver heads in here in the room. You can join me in saying you're over 50. Um, that's where Judah is. Judah is at that age and he still is able to change and to turn his life around and to stand for God in that space. Now the rest of the story, you're going to have to come back next week so that you can hear. But the important thing for today is just to have a look at the brothers and to see their failings but also to look with hope and to know that failings don't need to define us for our entire lives. That God's grace is available for us to change and to grow. And that's what we remember very much so when we come into communion, isn't it? I'm going to ask that the helpers please help us by distributing the communion elements. Uh, if you're someone that has put your faith and trust in Christ today, I encourage you to please join with us in celebrating in communion. And if you're not, then please just raise a hand and they'll just pass the elements on by to someone else. As we come into communion, we very much remember that Jesus was not someone who stood aside. In fact, Jesus not only uh, stood up, but he stood up for all of us that have failed in life. For every mistake that we have made, for every careless word, for every uh, action that we've regretted, for every inaction that we've not carried out. Jesus is the one who stands in the gap to fulfill perfection for us. To live the perfect life and to sacrifice himself so that we might be forgiven and saved. When we come to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23, 24, it says of Jesus that when they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats back to them. Instead, he entrusted him to the Father, to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins 
in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness so that by his wounds we will be healed. It is only through Christ and through all that Christ has done that he has paved the way back for us. As we read through the passage of brothers, we might identify ourselves more with Reuben. Maybe we're someone who has dodged blame for the wrong things that we have done in the past. Maybe we've refused to accept accountability. And if that's us, the great news is that we don't need to stay that way. That we can be Judas who change. Who will stand up and own responsibility for what we have done. But in owning responsibility, we know that we cannot make amends. It is only through Christ that all that we have done that has been wrong can be forgiven, can be washed away, can be cleansed. And so in the elements that you've been distributed today, there are two portions. The first is the bread. And the bread speaks to us and reminds us of Christ's body that has been nailed to the cross. So for every shameful thing that we have done, for every word that we have uttered that we need to repent of, Christ was nailed to that cross for us and for that sin so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be saved. Just in the quietness of these moments, you might reflect on those things in your own life and take this element this morning and remember what Jesus has done for you. Please take and eat. us of Christ's blood and the memorial of the blood being shed is a reminder of the promise that God has given, the new covenant promise that all we need to do is believe in Jesus. Nothing of ourselves, nothing is earned, nothing is deserved. It is all from that gift and by faith we believe and are forgiven and the past is done away with. Please take and drink this morning in remembrance of Christ. This morning, if you've been reminded or refreshed and God has placed a burden on your heart that you want to talk to somebody or you'd like to pray for something that is going on in your life, then we would like to show care and support and love for you. And we have a prayer corner up here on the right. And it is a great place to be able to go and to pray with someone who is trained and equipped and would love to be able to support you and walk with you through those trials in prayer. And I would encourage you after the service if you would head over and to join them there. For those that are members this morning, just a quick reminder, there is a members meeting after the service a little while. It'll be on 11. So there's lots of time for coffee and chatting out there. Uh, But we're going to meet back in here around 11 for those that are church members. I'm going to ask you now uh, if you would just stand and we're going to pray together as we close off our service. Let's do that now. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, that your mercies are new every morning, that your grace knows no bounds, that your forgiveness uh, knows no end, that no matter what we have done in our lives, Father, nothing is too big for Jesus to forgive. 
And so we stand this morning, not as people who try and stand in our own merit and our own works, our own good deeds, but we stand only in the grace that has been shown us through Jesus. Help us as we take our steps out of this auditorium and into the rest of our weeks to seek to live for you in all that we have. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Please have a great morning. And remember, if you'd like to pray with someone, come and join us up at the prayer corner.